Well, everyone, last Friday you joined me for the beginning of a fantastic apocalyptic tale of terror. And much to my evil amusement, I left you on a bit of a clinghanger. But, of course, I promised that we would return again this week, and I have kept my promise. So, my dear friends, are you ready to return to Satan's Theatre? I do so very dearly hope so. Well, for those of you who didn't join us last week, don't worry, I've put all parts of the story together in this one video, and if you did, then you can skip forward to about the halfway mark. Check the timestamps in the video description. Well, my dear friends, it's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. One Colt AR-15 semi-automatic assault rifle. Two banana-designed magazines, each packed with 30 rounds of 5.56mm NATO ammunition. One semi-depleted box of backup munitions containing an additional 30 rounds plus change. One G29 Glock safe action pistol. One box magazine holding 17 9mm parabellum rounds. One full box of backup munitions containing an additional 100 rounds. One bolo style, military grade machete, relatively sharp. One neutral colored rain poncho. Two canisters of CS tear gas. One flashbang grenade. One empty military grey canteen, green in color. One thermal blanket. One multi pocket military backpack of urban camouflage coloring to hold it all. Mulling over her inventory in precise detail, Krista attempted to commit everything to memory, something she prided herself on for being borderline eidetic. She squatted in the same house she had first come to after Lost Hills had fallen, the same one with stains coating the carpets and broken windows, and smelled of a malodorous amalgamation of roadkill and fire smoke. It was a single house, strayed from the rest in the neighbourhood of the Canyon Road. The road it sat on led up to a steep incline, into a higher scale collection of Art Deco houses, bordering the very edge of the suburbs. At their backyards, there was Chaparral, and a myriad hills before one would reach the isolated asylum she had extricated herself from. Trees grew more scarcely in this area, and often appeared dead, or at least in slumber. Though her endeavours in searching the first couple upscale houses yielded no fruit, it was fortuitous she found some semblance of shelter from the wind and rain. It appeared as though the newer houses had been prime targets for looting, yet the miscreants had overlooked the sequestered abode she had come across. It was built almost like a log cabin, although more extensive in the amount of rooms it contained. The insulation felt relatively modern, and she had done her best to hammer various building materials over the shattered windows, most of which were scavenged from the shed in the backyard. The wind and cold still crept through the cracks, despite her best efforts. Her sweater and pants offered meagre protection from the bitter chills, even if she put the poncho on. She sat huddled in her thermal blanket, the crinkles evident even with the tiniest nuances in movement. But the aluminum foil-looking thing had kept her alive for the past few days, so she couldn't complain. The dim room allowed only a few cracks of the pale light from outside to seep in, and illuminate the small inventory she had neatly arranged in front of herself. Her canteen was empty, as she'd earlier gleaned. Whomever had occupied the house before her, they had left paltry supplies behind. She had found a bag of brown rice in the pantry, something she had crunched on for sustenance. Other than that, there was a box of vegetable broth, half used in the otherwise emptied fridge. She'd smelt it and taken a sip. It was old, but not spoiled. She figured the chilly weather had been sufficient to keep it from expiring. Through her meals of vegetable broth-soaked rice, her belly had growled with an animalistic fervor as her throat remained dry. She figured the salt in the broth wasn't helping her dehydration, but the house offered little recourse for such an issue. 
she had searched high and low for any kind of water purifier, even willing to tempt her fate with a charcoal pitcher if she could seek one out, but to no purchase. Every upscale house above held no boons to aid her, and she felt she had covered more than half the neighborhood. Furniture, paintings, showers she couldn't use, she hated what the water had become, the antithesis of what it had once been, life. The gas was out in this portion of the city. She'd seen an enormous crater in the center of the neighborhood above, fractured piping and burn marks making the reasons evident. She had no matches, no lighter, nothing so much as flint and steel. Try as she had, lighting a fire seemed impossible. She could not boil water, even as it ran in superfluity from every faucet. Sometimes she stood in front of a faucet, turned on, staring down with hollow eyes and a pallid expression befitting her scenario. She would have to move on today. All the rice was gone, and she was slowly dying of thirst. Even if further into the suburbs and closer to the city was more dangerous, well, so be it. She had the means of defending herself. She mostly worried of encounters with Alphas or the other humans left over. The changed she would deal with and get by as she needed. Krista stood and stretched, allowing the blanket to fall from her back. Perhaps if she were lucky, she would come across her sister. She grinned wryly. Oh, my dear dim-witted crystal, where art thou? Her stomach loudly growled in response. <laughs> dear stomach, I have received your numerous transmissions, and am in agreement. I too am completely starving. Please stop spamming my brain with your signals. Thank you, she muttered. Her deep blue eyes glazed languidly over her gear, and she knelt down beginning to pack it all back inside. Once everything was ready, she slung the rifle over her back and holstered the pistol. In one hand, she carried the bolo machete. She used the other to pull the hood of the poncho over her dark bangs and push the front door open. Into the cold, sprinkling weather she forayed, exiting the property and continuing down the canyon road until she finally reached the first intersection of the main suburbs. Even after only a mile of walking, her legs already felt weak. She groaned at the shaky feeling, scanning the surroundings of her first path of houses. Decrepit. Ransacked. Abandoned. She gleaned changed, roaming aimlessly along the road further down, and grunted, knowing she would have to go that way in order to reach the various outlying plazas of convenience stores and pharmacies. She convinced herself to search the houses for leftovers, but she knew her calories were burning fast. She needed better chances of rewards, and she had no clue if the houses had been truly abandoned by their owners or not. The last thing that would help her appetite and thirst would be a double-barreled shotgun aimed at her head. Public property was always a safer bet in her experiences. She gave the bolo a few practice swings and felt her arms beginning to tire out. The muscle fatigue was alarming, but not wholly surprising. She elected to holster the machete in its sleeve and draw her rifle. She adjusted the iron sights and knelt down, steeling herself to fire. With a loud pop, the first shot detonated, illuminating all the space around her as the clattering of the brass shell casing resounded along the asphalt. The first shot, although her aim felt shaky due to hunger, landed a headshot in the nearest changed. The others, seeing the flash, put a spotlight to their potential meal, began to turn and stumble towards her. Krista stood and sauntered towards each, wishing she had the strength to trust herself with the sheathed melee weapon. It was a waste to use ammunition at such close range. 
As each came close, she fired a single time into their head, and was rewarded with identical results in each trigger pull. One by one, they fell. She silenced over a dozen before their groans finally succumbed to silence, and she lowered her rifle, smiling. Such fodder, she taunted a body, tapping it with the end of her shoe as the hole in its head spilled black blood into a large, swelling pool beneath the pile. Stepping around the pile, she nonchalantly unloaded her magazine and rolled her backpack around to the side of her body using her offhand to place the ejected cartridge into a side net. She opened the pack, letting the rifle fall by its sling to her side. She rummaged until she found the box of long rifle rounds, and began popping them out one by one. She worked as she walked, not fully paying attention of whatever lie ahead. Pulling the action on the rifle back, she chambered an extra round and moved the bolt back into the firing position. Then she began to fill her magazine back up until it would take no more bullets. Once she zipped the backpack up and reloaded the magazine, she gasped in surprise, halting in her tracks as she almost tripped over the charred bumper of a car. She looked beyond and noticed the rest of the vehicle was nearby. It was a vacant, burned-out shell. Hardly recognizable, save for the fact it was once a minivan. Her eyes scanned around the van, and she quickly realized she'd come across a large parking lot, one the road had turned into. Crystal looked behind herself, seeing she had veered off the main road. The parking lot belonged to that of a large mall, she surmised, gazing across the parking lot positively filled with charred and twisted metals. She cocked an eyebrow wondering what could have happened to cause every single abandoned car to have been cast ablaze. As she cautiously trudged through an asphalt aisle, keeping an eye for any change lurking in between the skeletal wrecks, she kept looking ahead to the mall itself. It appeared derelict, as she expected, the lower windows boarded and caged off to the public. But what really piqued her interest with the many messages scrawled in graffiti along the entire bottom. The whole scene felt vaguely uncanny to her. She was curious why a place that must have held host to so many people as society was falling could now be deserted. Nothing so much as a corpse seemed to decorate the other morbid and ubiquitous remains. The cars. So many. All the same. Burnt. Melted, deformed. As she grew closer to the frontal walls, she could make out the various messages upon the walls. She'd expected gang nonsense, (laughs) or phallic imagery, but she was startled by the rather poignant and even foreboding notes others before her had left. Leaving this world is not as scary as it seems. Do not enter. Cursed. Even the chain shall not tread here. You've gone too far. I'll have more fun in hell. And finally, God doesn't watch inside here. Different colors, different graffiti styles, different messages. She examined each closely, the silence, all-consuming in total exacerbating her bad case of nerves. Peering high up, she gazed upon the whitewashed sign reading the name of the mall. Cold Pine Mall. Before the end, she had scarcely strayed towards this side of town. Her family had resided in the more upscale areas in the eastern suburbs, further from the city. Despite the seedy nature of her surroundings, She was impressed by the sheer size of the supercenter. Krista looked left and right, searching for a way inside. She chalked the messages up to people scaring others away before they could intrude. She made sure her rifle was ready to encounter any hoodlums within. The underbarrel flashlight attachment functioned well, and she had no reservations of trespassing if it meant the potential for food. 
It seemed she had overlooked a colloquial entrance of sorts. A dark patch of the interior peeking out from behind a board that seemed to have been torn off based on the nails lying around the panel of what she assumed had been a window. Then, someone had propped it back up, as though to hide inside. Krista sharply exhaled and turned on her flashlight, peering inside the broken window. Inside, she gleaned what looked to be a clothing department. She noticed the silhouettes of stationary mannequins within, still donning their respective apparel and staring into empty space with lifeless, glazed eyes. Besides the clothing strewn about the ground on occasion, and the rare overturned mannequin, she was pleasantly surprised to see the store had been largely untouched. It seemed as though everyone had left in a hurry, and ever since then, nothing had entered the dusted palace. Krista pushed the board aside and shimmied her way inside, prudently scanning the area for any changed or ambushes. Every silhouette in her periphery remained still as she searched the first room, making sure they all really were mannequins. Satisfied that she was alone, Krista began to venture further into the very dark department store. The smells of old cloth and mothballs wafting through her nostrils softly as her footsteps echoed against the far walls. In the abject silence, it seemed every noise she made proceeded with great headway, disappearing into the darkness. Though the first location had been empty, Krista remained on her toes, knowing people could be further inside. But she also knew she would have the jump on them. If there were others within, she would see whatever light they had before they saw hers. She cupped her hand over her torch, just enough to allow a small sliver of her LED to pierce through, just enough to see where she was going. She was intrigued by just how dark it was inside, even though it was the middle of daytime outside, even if there were clouds. The pale light still should have cast more within the place than she was noticing. Krista exited the clothing department and the central hallway, where all storefronts pervade their names and various inviting odours to all passers-by. At least, they had. Now, the silent ruin was only a morbid reminder of what society had been. Peering left and right, she was mildly surprised by the fact that the entire place appeared pitch black. No barrel fires to ward off the cold. No residual lighting from any storefronts revived potentially by generators. And no other flashlights. There was nothing but silence and darkness. She sighed gently, collecting herself, and resolved to find a directory, hoping to find her way to the food court. If she was lucky, she would find something left over in the back of an eatery, some non-perishable item that could bolster her beyond the paltry meal she had consumed in the past few days. Feeling more comfortable without the presence of any other lights, she pulled her hand away from her own light, and instead repurposed it to hold firm to the foregrip. It was more than obvious that no electricity ran through the mall anymore. Of course... She'd expected as much, but again, she felt a nagging thought resurface at the back of her head, stirring her nerves a bit. The sheer darkness. Even the skylights above, as many malls had, seemed to let no light inside. She pointed her own light briefly upwards, squinting to make out what the cause of this was. As she observed, a stark realization came across her, almost making her shiver. Through the translucent white glass, Christ could very well make out the blurry edges of wood slats, the dark knots of wood grain showing through more than the lighter brown surfaces they resided within. Someone, for a reason she could not possibly discern, had gone to the effort of covering the natural light sources along the rooftop. As far as she could see, it appeared all of them had been obscured. She breathed more heavily, 
feeling somewhat dizzy as she looked back down. She felt darkness creep to the edges of her periphery, and quickly retreat once she had leveled her vision again. She shook her head briefly, and used her offhand to pull the hood of her poncho down to accentuate her vision. Her mind raced to reach a conclusion as to why someone would do such a thing to the roof. Humans desired light. There were no nocturnal predators, no creatures holding host to luminescent parts. If the darkness was so immensely swallowing, so totally engulfing in the daytime, she was loath to imagine that it could get worse at nighttime. So, no one in their right mind would go to such levels of effort to maintain such odd conditions, conditions that belied the need for her own kind to see, to know what lies in the unknown parts. And only a person could have done such a thing. Of course, the changed were far too parochial to perform anything than their rote tasks of eating and walking. Alphas were different, but still not so coordinated. She elected not to imagine what would drive a person, or people, to commit such eccentric and counterintuitive acts. Be as it may, however, the happenstance withheld a boon. So long as it meant no one could be in the moor with her, she would feel fine. No matter someone's insanity, physical restrictions would always place a buffer zone of plausible deniability. A man with schizophrenia would not be able to climb walls like a spider, and so on and so on. A person so deluded as to cover an entire moor with darkness would not be able to see through the darkness any more than she. As she walked through the dark hallway, the silence pressing from both sides like thick, suffocating blankets, she idly reminisced of the lessons her father had taught her and her sister. Those old, esoteric lessons that only someone as eccentric as him would bring to light. He had shown them scary movies at young ages, ages many would judge inappropriate for such violent and blood-soaked cinema. However, having worked in the movies industry as a prop designer, he had a better grasp on these bloody moments than most. He would pause during a scene where someone had been decapitated, and play the movie frame by frame to illuminate where exactly the jump cut had occurred where the actor had been swapped with a dummy. He edified them on what squibs were, and how they could be remotely detonated to simulate explosions of blood and gunfire peppering walls. He described how computer generation was able to portray realistic scenarios on grander scales, to save on practical effect budgeting. Camera pannings of massacred civilians and soldiers in war movies and such. At greater distances, they'd learned, the resemblance between humans and their 3D dummy counterparts were uncanny. He described how the intestines spilling from underneath shirts were frequently made of marshmallows wrapped in latex, painted red and brown. The many wonders of what liquid latex and cotton could create in the department of rotten and charred flesh. Krista and her sister had initially been bothered by his lessons, but both girls had grown accustomed to them as time passed. She knew her sister had grown excited by them, and, admittedly, she had begun to enjoy them too. The lessons were endearing, allowing the girls to have a much more adept understanding of the fine line between reality and media. She remembered her father telling them of his reasons, how important these lessons were to teach at such a young age, to imprint the brain wiring, as it were. As a result, she and her sister were seldom scared by books, movies, or even attractions at fairs and amusement parks around Halloween. It had all been so terribly boring, but also wonderfully empowering. Seeing others cower in fear as she and her sister could stand back and mentally note what caused the particular gory scene to occur practically. But, even if this was the case, there were still fears they were born with, seemingly. For her sister, Crystal, hated spiders. She always had and always would. She never had any nasty run-in with the beasts as a child, nor had she gone through a traumatizing situation regarding the creatures. It seemed as though it was a spontaneous quality genetically inherited. 
Krista, on the other hand, had a more relevant fear. Something backed with a morbid potency that she could never seem to shake off, no matter how she tried to condition herself. Skeletons. Grisly, charred, clean, it didn't seem to matter. The mere sight of them had caused some intrinsic revulsion she had no control over, akin to a deep, primal fear such as falling or loud noises. Human skeletons in particular. She could attribute that to her childhood, unlike Crystal. Their father had been showcasing a horror about piranhas to them, and there had been one scene in particular that had deeply unsettled her, against her willpower. There had been a setup of a shot displaying the flow of a freshwater river. A black jungle cow had been forced to ford the river, and had nearly submerged everything but the very top of its head as to allow its nostrils to breathe. The palette had been grainy and dark, the cinematography telling of some terrible, impending travesty. The cow had begun moaning and mooing loudly, a myriad bubbles rising up from around it on all sides as the murky water quickly turned red. The terrible bleats of the creature sounded tortured, in the utmost agony. She had been shocked when it had emerged on the other side, scant amounts of muscles and nerves attached to the skeleton as the remains of the chewed guts spilled from what had been its belly. The coward staggered lamely across the ground for several feet, the terrible silver fish flopping and still chewing at whatever remained on its skeletonized, still-living body. The sheer amount of blood was harrowing enough, but what truly unsettled her was the fact that the poor creature's head appeared perfectly intact, whilst nearly everything below was completely decimated. It had collapsed to the ground pathetically, and breathed heavily for several more seconds, before its still-beating heart was torn into by a fish, and it quickly bled out as the thoracic cavity was breached. Her sister had also thought the scene particularly unsettling, but their father had paused and explained to them the magic of blue screen effects, in combination with a well-trained cow that had waded, in truth, across a river in Ohio, and not the Amazon. Crystal had been awed by how realistic it had looked, and was interested in keeping watching. Krista had hid her utter shock beneath a small smile, nodding at her father's information. She didn't dare tell them, and appear looking weaker than her sister. Further down the line, a man had been climbing across a vine, and Krista had been watching wide-eyed and slack-jawed, cold sweat trickling down the nape of her young neck as she watched in anticipatory horror, until the man fell in as the ominous music crescendoed. She'd squeezed her eyes shut, not looking as his horrified screams came to par with the cows. After the cries had ceased, she peeked out, just in time to see his gristle-culted skull float to the riverbank, an eyeball hanging out and the jaw agape in silent horror. Crystal had heard her dad chuckling at the scene, and had actually joined in at just how over the top it had been played out. Just to be sure, her father had been certain to show them the behind-the-scenes features in the movie menu, to add more than his own insight into the production process. Krista absently stared at the ground as her sister and father had watched with intrigue, seeing the special effects used in the river scenes. She'd looked up, a faraway gaze in her eyes, to see the actor had been devoured standing outside the river, covered in fake blood and wrapped in a blanket as he grinned widely into the camera. A producer had him hold up his skull as she explained how they had created the prop. The director commented on nonchalant things, like how the river had been cold, and the actors and actresses who had entered usually needed hot showers afterwards. She hadn't been listening. Those horrible moments kept playing in her head on loops. As her dad and sister kept watching the behind-the-scenes footage, she had subconsciously curled into a ball onto the couch, feeling terrified even though her father sat directly next to her, and her sister next to him. Nightmares came 
for years afterwards, though she never dared relent and tell her parents what they were about, no matter how many times they had run into her, screaming. She remembered always looking across the room to her soundly sleeping sister, her hateful envy bubbling just beneath the surface of how easily she had shaken the movie away. Every movie their father had showed them after that, she remained indefinitely apprehensive of a monster eating someone, leaving only the bones behind in disgustingly quick fashion. A person falling into a vat of acid to have their remains float to the top. A fiery explosion searing the flesh off those caught in it in borderline cartoonish manners. Of course, her father had explained everything away and remained none the wiser to Christa's plight. Nor did her sister or her mother. No one ever knew because she never told them. No matter how much he had explained to her how fake it had all been, she couldn't shake the animal fear that they pierced her with, because she knew skeletons were real. She avoided touching her eye socket edges, or even her teeth. The bump on the side of her wrist made her nauseous whenever she looked at it. She tried her best to avoid even looking at people's kneecaps. Even today, that deep, repressed fear lingered in dark places. She'd only ever told her therapist, one she claimed to see for unrelated reasons to her family, for which they fully supported her. She only told him because she knew he could tell no one else her disclosures by law. I couldn't hurt you, had always been the caveat of his sessions. Skeletons are a natural part of us, like muscles and blood and organs. None of those bother you, right? They didn't, but his rationalizations had never truly helped her. She continued her low, careful steps, of which still echoed in the abject silence. A directory had pointed her to the north side in order to reach the food court, so that's where she went. She at last reached a large, almost cavernous rotunda, filled to the brim with overturned tables and chairs. Surrounding the centre were a variety of eateries, long since deserted, and coated with a fine layer of dust. The first she approached was a Mexican food restaurant, the sign once neon and yellow, as she ran her flashlight over the cheerful cartoon boy wearing a sombrero and holding a burrito. She mantled the counter, and slowly worked her way inside, moving her LED over the various equipment near the back used to prepare the food. A deep fryer, a tortilla press, a griddle. She pressed into the back, making her way past the kitchen until she reached the metal door of what she presumed to be food storage. She opened the creaking door slowly, wincing as she heard even the modest noise reverberate throughout the food center. Peeking inside with the barrel of her gun and the flashlight, she smiled upon seeing the metal racks of a pantry. On the shelves resided a few cans of pinto beans, black beans, stale taco shells, moldy tortillas, cans of enchilada sauce, and various canned vegetables. <laughs> Should have brought a bigger pack, she muttered to herself, although not allowing the elation of finding food to be lost on her empty stomach. With little thought, she tore open a package of the taco shells, and quickly began to crunch loudly upon them, savouring the hard, borderline tasteless food more than anything. Although difficult to consume, she'd no doubt the meal would satisfy for a time, and possibly bolster her weak muscles until she found a way to properly open the cans. Krista searched high and low for a can opener, yet to no purchase. Tentatively, she extracted her bolo machete, and gazed upon it wistfully, wondering if she would waste more food in trying to open the cans than she would procure. As she continued to devour the stale shells, she began to fill her backpack to its brim, loading it heavily down with beans, vegetables, and even a large can of enchilada sauce, before she zipped it back up and sighed contentedly. Her luck appeared in her favour, it seemed. <laughs> 
At her first try, she'd already found enough food to feed her for a week if she rationed. She would make it a point to camp nearby and keep salvaging non-perishables from the other retreats, still surrounding her and untouched by others. She chuckled to herself as she climbed over the counter once again and dusted herself off as she began to make headway back with her pregnant backpack. Though her pack was heavy, she found solace in the shell she continued munching on, still catching the flavors of grease and salt despite the expired nature of the taco constituents. She remembered she'd passed a camping store not too far back. Perhaps, if she was lucky, she could find a propane stove and cook her meals to warm her cold insides. She could spend the night in a tent and set up propane lanterns to illuminate the dreary place. She grinned, liking the idea. Already, with more food in her system, she felt positive thoughts begin floating back to her, erecting the layout of plans she would practice in the next few days. Collect as much food as she could, salvage what supplies she wanted from the capping store, load it all into a shopping cart or a bigger rolling backpack, whatever she could find. Krista paused her steps, however, thinking that she heard something behind her. She turned around and, unsurprisingly, there was nothing. Perturbed, but not frightened, she chalked it up to the echoes of her own footfalls, reverberating in odd ways in the cave-like structure she now walked through. It had almost sounded like a clattering sound, though, something far different than her rubber soles connecting to the linoleum below. Not metallic clattering, though, nothing so brazen or loud. It sounded vaguely more subtle, like someone was dropping sticks upon other sticks. All the same, she shrugged it off, and found the camping store after a significant amount of backtracking. She shone her flashlight inside, pleasantly surprised to see how untouched the place appeared. Displays were still up, and boxes were still neatly organized on shelves. Her light glazed over something white, a creamy pale, and standing slightly taller than her. Two orbits resided within. In the brief second they'd been illuminated, she was convinced they were eyes. Shooting the light hurriedly back, she breathed a small sigh of relief to see it was just another mannequin, dressed in a fisherman's overalls and wearing a bucket hat. He was holding a fishing rod in one hand, appearing in the motion of mid-cast. Oh, you're alone, she murmured, reassuring herself. Oh, relax. Krista began to rummage through the various displays, searching for the items most befitting of her future endeavors. In her search, she managed to scrounge propane tanks, a propane lantern, a tent in its packaging, a sleeping bag, a propane stove, and a Swiss army knife. She was ecstatic to find that it did, indeed, have a can opener module, among several other features. Screwing a tank into the lantern, she watched the two yellow orbs within begin to heat up, and gradually become lighter until they glowed white hot, lighting up nearly the entire store. Smiling in satisfaction, she turned her rifle's flashlight off, and looked at the gear she had taken. Oh, just gotta find a way to move the rest of this, she muttered, peering at the items quizzically as she finished the last of her taco shells and dropped the plastic wrappings they'd been housed into the floor. Her growling stomach had finally seemed to quiet, but she still desired more substantial nutrition nonetheless. However, Krista wished to deploy the stove before doing anything else even if it meant waiting a bit longer for her food to be ready. She would much prefer hot beans to cold. By the lantern light, she began to work, pulling the green metallic thing from its cardboard box and figuring out how to stand it up properly. As her metallic clanks and clatters echoed through the empty place, she again thought she heard something. That different clattering. 
By the lantern light, she began to work, pulling the green metallic thing from its cardboard box and figuring out how to stand it up properly. As her metallic clanks and clatters echoed through the empty space, she again thought she heard something. That different clattering. She immediately paused and stared to the store entrance, attempting to discern whether she was imagining the noise or not. It sounded distant, and yet easily distinguishable in the ubiquitous quiet she was immersed in. She waited for thirty seconds. There was nothing. About to go back to work. Krista nearly gasped aloud when the noise, now very distinctly not her own, came again from far away outside. She knew the noise. It had been something she'd heard earlier. That same hollow clattering. She took several deep breaths and began rationalizing it to herself. Yes. Maybe the wind had come in through the hole she'd made to enter, and was knocking things over all the way back in the clothing department. Maybe a changed had smelled her, and was wandering dumbly around, searching for its supposed meal. Maybe a person had followed her in. She shuddered lightly at that last thought. She wanted to dim the lantern, as to not give away her position. But she was more resourceful than that. She began thinking of how to proceed when the noise came again, definitely in the direction she had entered from. She grunted, sighing indignantly. She would have to pause her respite in order to find recourse to her situation. She figured the noise must have been the mannequins in the clothing store being knocked over, based on the hollow nature of the noises. She felt disoriented by the fact that no changed would seek the figures out for the false promise of fresh flesh. They would not have any smell. No, it would have come straight to her position, shambling along the path she had previously taken. No, 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 it couldn't be a changed. The noises kept echoing down the enormous hallways, increasing in frequency and, as it seemed, loudness. At this point, they almost seemed violent. Whatever it was, it did not have subtlety in mind. If it was a person trying to sneak up on her, wouldn't they try to be stealthy? Krista quickly thought of a plan and elected to keep her lantern alight. Rather than dim it in the hopes of avoiding confrontation, she figured, whatever it was, she didn't want sharing them all with her. Rather, she stepped behind the sales counter and propped up several large boxes to obscure her upper half, save a small slit, enough so she could poke her rifle barrel through and cast a single, steely blue gaze above the iron sights. She'd moved the lantern closer to the front of the store, darkening the area she had sequestered herself within. Taking hold of a can of fish bait, she arched an arm upwards and heaved it across from her encampment, seeing it land in the linoleum hallway and tumble across loudly until it smacked against the cage, sealing off the beauty store directly across from her. Whatever was inside with her, the noise she made would expedite its attempts to seek her out. The distant clattering stopped and her eye lowered ready to fire upon whatever came into view. If it was a person, she would yell at them to put their weapons down. If it were people, she would gun them down unless they were unarmed. If it was anything else, she would also gun it down. An idle thought crept through her mind, that maybe an animal had wandered inside. Her mouth watered at the prospect of meat, even if it was a stray dog, just the thought of greasy, succulent, delicious flesh caused her to smile almost lewdly. She would marinate a choice cut in the enchilada sauce, let it ferment nicely for a few hours, and then she would sear it on the propane stove until a nice, crusty char appeared on each side. Then she would serve beans on the side, 
hot and soaked in their own juices, coalescing with the grease of the meat. As she stewed over the potentially delicious meal, she again began to hear the clattering. Closer. Louder. Its echoes tumbled down the hallway, coating every inch of empty space with noise. The balcony walkways of the second floor above her sounded as though they were the source of the noise, even though she was almost positive it was on her floor. Despite the increasing intensity of the noise, she still had great difficulty in discerning what exactly could be creating such a cacophony. She imagined, again, it would be the noise of someone running around with a backpack full of sticks, dry and clattering. It was the noise of hollow plastic tumbling across a flat linoleum floor, being dragged violently by some anomaly of evolution, depraved enough to commit such an unsettling act. It sounded like bones, even. Bones. Her narrowed, concentrated eye opened, as did her other one. Her iron sights blurred from her focus of vision as the latter thought began to fester within. No. No. Why did she have to think of that? Something made of bones, grisly and charred, wet, stinking and rotting. Something unimaginable, something impossible. Images of horrific things flashed through her head as she desperately tried to remain focused on her weapon sights. Her breathing had increased, as had her heartbeat. Krista's stomach twisted and turned in nervousness. She began remembering the Piranha movie. The scene she had repressed so deftly seemed to bubble back up with a fraction of the effort it took to hide them away. The man, the man, he was alive, the cow, alive. The morbid curiosity had stemmed from such a trauma, however. She had researched, hoping to further sequester the idea into disbelief that mere fish could do such things to her fellow humans. Well, though exaggerated, the movie had not been terribly far off from reality, she had found out. Sitting at a computer chair, her young, glimmering eyes quivering in fear as she scanned the articles, reading through actual events of piranha killings. The events were rare, but not impossible. They had happened. Chemical accidents where flesh was wholly melted away, leaving the macabre remnants. Even more common, especially in third world countries. She hated the thoughts, but their intensity seemed to be surging as an insurmountable epicenter of fear began to rock her to her core. Her brain was trying to convince her that something evil was coming towards the storefront. Something ungodly, some new type of change that retained nerve function even after its flesh had been eaten off, just like the piranha victims. What was coming toward her was a human skeleton, and it wanted to eat her. It would eat her alive, its terrible, dry teeth grinding and hissing as it would bite chunks away from her screaming form. Its strength would be impossible, even lacking in muscles. It would snap her own limbs like toothpicks, breaking her body until she couldn't run anymore. She would watch helplessly as it tore into her soft parts, taking scores of intestine and guts out with every savage tear, digging its bloody skull deeper. Oh, shut up, she whispered, gritting her teeth stealing herself to fire. She was infuriated to feel tears running down her cheeks, in disbelief of how much she had let her nerves get the better of her. It was an animal. No, it was a changed. No, it was a person. Whatever it was, it was no childhood nightmare, as her brain betrayed her into believing. That was completely irrational. 
The clattering ceased. The total silence returned. Chris was shocked to only hear the beating of her heart in her ears again. She held her breath in anticipation, pursing her lips as the noise had been so loud. She assumed whatever it had been was just around the corner. And then, unbelievably, a voice came. Hello? Small and timid. Feminine. It sounded so incredibly familiar. Krista was given pause. She lowered her weapon and her sharp blue eyes widened when she realized who it had belonged to. Crystal? She replied. Krista, is that you? The voice asked. It was impossible. There was no way her sister, a sister she knew had no clue where Krista was, could possibly have found her and followed her into the darkness. Step around the corner, Crystal. Let me see you in the light, Krista demanded, incredulous. It had to be some other woman playing a trick on her. Someone who knew of her sister and was manipulating Krista to drop her guard. The dark-haired girl's jaw dropped, however, when she indeed saw her very own sister step out from around the corner, arms folded behind her back politely, and her eyes fluttering in that sickening, girlish way that she'd hated so much. Oh, the heterochromia iridium. Even at her distance, she could tell one eye was blue like hers, and the other was green. And the dyed red hair. In the voluptuous frame, even she had to admit she was sometimes envious of, despite herself. She was standing before her, and Krista could not believe it. She pulled her rifle off her sling and placed it on the counter in front of her. Krista slowly walked around and stepped closer to her sibling in utter shock. Why didn't you say something when I first went in? Krista asked, lacing her words with characteristic haughtiness to hide her happiness at the chance meeting. I thought you were something else. Her sister smiled sweetly. <laughs> what did you think I was? She stooped down and picked up the lantern so it was closer to her pretty face. I don't know. Krista put a hand to her aching head and looked to Crystal, finding herself returning the smile. God, I'm just glad it's you. What happened to you anyways? Are the others safe? Krista. Her sister spoke in a low, goading tone. What on earth did you think I was? Krista cocked an eyebrow, perplexed. Uh, why? What does it matter? Crystal's smile turned a bit darker. Her brow lowered, and her lips grew tight in the grin. The shadows cast dramatically over her face took a more unpleasant turn. Crystal? she asked, vexed by her sister's odd disposition. What's wrong with you? Did you think maybe I was a monster? She asked in a hissing whisper. In the same second she had finished the bizarre question, she shot a hand up to the knob of the propane lantern and quickly extinguished the light. In the brief split second Krista had to react, to gaze upon her sibling for one final time, she had seen a flash of something. Maybe it had been in the shadows, but her eyes seldom lied to her. In that flash of light, there had not been a loved one standing before her. No. It had looked deathly skinny. Dry. Skeletal. Without flesh. Missing eyes. Krista cried out in fear, screaming her sister's name repeatedly as she stumbled backwards, reaching for her rifle desperately, yearning to turn the flashlight on. Crystal, she exclaimed, bumping into the counter, 
and rubbing her hands over the smooth, cold top, seeking helplessly for her weapon, for her only light source. In the pitch black, she heard a terrifying, loud crash, as though glass had been violently shattered. It came from before her, sounding as though the lantern had been heaved through a window with great force. The fear within was staunch, fully imbuing her every racing thought as she found nothing but emptiness in every impending grasp. She shot her hand down and yanked her pistol out, wildly waving it back and forth, aiming at nothing she could see. There was nothing but a wall of black before her to focus on. Crystal, she squeaked, her voice hardly escaping her choked throat. Her hand not gripping the pistol with white knuckles kept searching vainly in her supposition that it was even still there. After several seconds of fruitless search, the terrified woman pulled waywards from the counter and stumbled forwards, bumping into something hard and dry, something terribly cold. Instinctively, she yelped in fear, throwing her aim forward and yanking the trigger. The gunshot was deafening in the relatively enclosed space the echoes reverberating more potently than the clattering ever had. In the terse flash of yellow, there had been a smidgen of a sight, something to give a marginal piece of feedback into what she had fired into. It had been the mannequin, of which had now toppled over from the Newtonian force suddenly implanted inside of it. Crystal, she croaked again, begging what she hoped was really her sister to reply. There was nothing. She fell back to the floor, patting it in desperation for what she hoped her AR-15 would be. After what felt like ages, but in reality was mere seconds, her fingers scraped the metal barrel. Sighing tenuously in relief, she yanked it up, and shoved her firearm back inside its holster. Standing up, Krista fumbled for her light switch, feeling intensely as though something was watching her with malicious intent. At last, she was able to activate the LED, and quickly shone it back and forth throughout the store, swallowing heavily as she rapidly understood there was nothing else within. She was alone. As Krista surveyed the store, she gleaned that the lantern had indeed been thrown through a front window. The tiny, crystal-like shards of glass glinted back at her like stars in the dead night sky. She observed the wrecked lantern strewn across the way, residing near where she had tossed the fish bait to gain the intruder's attention. Clambering forwards, her legs wobbly with nauseous fear, Krista leaned down and snapped up her backpack, keeping her eyes locked on the entrance and the threatening darkness beyond. The eerie silence had again returned. Now she could only hear the crunches of her boots upon broken glass as she slowly made her way outside the store, still feeling a strong sense of disquiet. Even disregarding what had just happened, her instincts were screaming for her to run away to assume flight over any kind of fight. Her whole body seemed to be vibrating in fear, tense and impossibly cold as nervous beads of sweat ran down the nape of her neck. Despite the potential gains of remaining and salvaging what she could, Krista could not shake the overwhelming feeling of dread the place instilled in her, the sheer horror. Exiting the camping store, she looked behind herself, the powerful light beam casting its illumination as far back as the first tables and chairs of the food court. Beyond them, she could only see darkness. That same awful wall of black she had nearly been devoured by. Before she turned away, however, a distant form caught her attention. Human. 
shrouded mostly by darkness, but the outlines remained enough to allow her to discern that it was standing far away and staring back at her. Who the fuck are you? She screamed, filled with a terror-fueled fury. I'm gonna shoot. The faraway form entered the peripheral light, however, and Krista was just as confused to see it was Crystal again. Only, she looked different this time. She was haggard and bedraggled. Her eyes were wide with fear, and her red hair was drenched in what appeared to be sweat. Even at this distance, Krista heard her hurried breaths, and knew just how filled with fear her sister was. It frightened the older sibling to see her little sister in such a state. She was loath to reminisce a single experience she'd endured to witness another human being more terrified than her sister looked in that moment. Crystal! She shrieked, fed up with her games. Krista! She sputtered, her voice weak and choked with anguish. In the even further distance, there was an unbelievable noise, something she was convinced could only have come from a banshee. A shriek, high-pitched and seemingly never-ending. It sounded close behind her sister, some unknown nightmare of folklore lurking just behind the veil of black. Crystal! The older sibling cried, beginning to run forward. <sighs> No! Crystal let out a blood-curdling scream as something impossibly fast yanked her down in a blur. She smacked her head on the floor going down and cracked it open. As blood began to spill profusely downwards from her gaping wound, the younger sister looked up for a final time, her gaze latent with intense sadness and fear. Then, something dragged her beyond the flashlight's reach, and into the darkness violently. Her screams were the only part not obscured by the spectacle as they quickly swelled into louder, more high-pitched wails of agony. Krista wanted to rush forward and help her poor sister, but she was rooted to the spot, petrified in a horrified stupor as the cacophony of shrieks were rapidly supplemented by loud tears and splats, along with wet snaps. Krista ground her teeth to dust in terror, unable to even scream in her own fear, as tears liberally spilled down her cheeks and dripped onto the cold linoleum beneath. The screams continued, along with the wet, disgusting smacks and slurps of some unseen horror devouring her sibling with a further only possible in ancient lore. Then, unbelievably, horribly, pieces began to fly out of the darkness and into her light's beam as the yells of her sister finally ceased. Something red and grisly, something sickeningly wet and bloody, still coated in a fine layer of meat and sinew. A bone! Krista's mouth opened to scream, but nothing escaped, save for a hoarse whisper. More came. Humor eye, cleaned ribs, a pelvis, pieces of phalanges and metatarsals, fragments chewed and torn by an abomination. And, as a final horrifying centerpiece, a circular, red-yellow object like a porcelain ball tumbled to rest in front of the rest of the gristle-coated remains. It slid perfectly in place to stare at her. One blue eye, the other green, still remaining within as strands of red, dyed hair still clung to the wet meat left behind. The eyes were wide, almost cartoonish in size, they looked directly at her, dead, but still so filled with pain and terror. Krista did not scream. She did not cry. She did not watch. Even as the first glimpse of the monster in the shadows came into view, she turned on a heel, 
and sprinted with every fiber of her being towards the way she had come. Her muscles burned, but her horrified brain did not care of such trifles. Running faster than any human before her, the girl bolted down the hallway, not even thinking to fire her weapon. She could not fight her worst nightmare with a piece of metal, interwoven with polymers and plastics. A piece of lead, or even several, would not halt the monstrosity behind her, the clattering of its footsteps seeming to grow even closer as she desperately tried to escape. As it gained on her, she began to hear rapid clicks, in addition to the awful clatters of its footsteps. She entered the clothing department, shoving past mannequins and toppling over any clothing racks that came into her path. It was only when she caught the glimpses of evening light streaming in through the board that she had pulled away and barreled into it without a single thought of the glass beneath that she was forced to turn around. As she tripped over the threshold of the shattered window, falling backwards into the dead grass strewn with shards of broken glass, she was forced to cast but a single gaze upon the amalgamation of terror that pursued. It was a human skeleton. Gigantic, nearly nine feet high. Its fingers were like claws, hanging with tendrils of fresh meat. Its insides were bloody, as though every piece of crystal it had devoured fell impotently through, splattering back to the ground of the kill site. Only when she looked upon the head did she even think to scream. The head was the skull of a fish. Enormous, completely disproportionate even to the mismatched skeleton it had been lodged into. Its eyes glowed a yellow hue, and its razor-sharp teeth revved up and down at the speed of a hummingbird beating its wings. The clicking was more evident to hear now, as its enormous eye sockets came within a foot of her face, ready to grind her expression into mincemeat with its chainsaw-like mouth. As her screams continued, and it fell upon her, she squeezed her eyes shut, awaiting her impending doom, the agonizing pain of being devoured alive. The utter horror of becoming a mess of what she feared most after it was done, like her sister. She screamed and screamed, but only after several seconds had passed was she able to briefly quiet and peek into the maw of darkness before her. The darkness. No creature residing within. Nothing eager to turn her inside out. Inside, she saw a shadow. Not hers. Not possible, as it stood within the black. Like a form of physicality, and yet not. It cast a shadow upon the darkness itself. She stared with wide, tearing eyes, as it seemed to stare back at her. Then, like a rush of spilled water, it dissipated into the ground itself. Krista shimmied backwards not feeling the punctures of broken glass into her palm as she made several meters of distance between herself and the square of black. She sat, breathing heavily, running a hand over her own body hurriedly as to make sure she was actually alive, actually real. As she sat, tearing and bleeding at the edge of the parking lot, fully lit in the cloud-covered evening, she pulled her knees close and buried her head into them. She began to cry, unable to control herself. As she wept, thoughts raced through her mind, unable to discern what exactly she had just witnessed. She asked herself what was real, what wasn't. Her sister, the monster, the noises. It had all been an hallucination. Krista sniffed deeply and wiped away her tears as she kept her seat, feeling too despondent to move from her position. 
as hot red ran down from both palms. She stared into the pale asphalt beneath, even as rain began to patter downwards from the pale above, she remained. It wasn't real. There was no conceivable way. There just wasn't. It had been her nutrient-deprived brain playing tricks on her. Even as she rationalized it to herself, Krista felt the difficulty in assuaging just how real it all felt. The total horror she had been consumed by. It wasn't real, she whispered. It wasn't. After nearly an hour of sitting, doing her best to explain away everything to herself, Krista stood and looked to her bloody hands, and then to the pale, gradually dimming sky above. It hadn't been real, but... She had to find Crystal now, more than ever. Not that she doubted she was hurt, or worse was out there, but certainly not inside the mall. Crystal was alive somewhere else, and Krista resolved to find her. She knew this because even in her stupor of terror, she remembered something. Something her brain had gotten wrong. Crystal's right eye had been blue, and her left was green. The heterochromia iridium. In reality, it was reversed. Krista chuckled in a jaded manner, the sound completely dry and devoid of any actual latent humor. Lightheaded and still recovering from her exhaustion, she made a final approach to the original white wall where she had gleaned all the other graffiti messages. She looked to her hands, with a depressed, surreal stoicism. Extending a bloody finger, her eyes were empty and pale as she inscribed her own warning. After the admonishment was complete, she took a few seconds to read it herself, and then turned around, ready to collapse and sleep somewhere dry. Then she would find the others. And then... She would find her real sister, not some monstrous hallucination. As she exited the parking lot, searching for an empty house to rest inside, the rain began to pour onwards, though her message remained guarded by a high awning. The caution read, Satan's Theatre. Well, quite a treat for you there for a Friday evening. I do hope you enjoyed that one as much as I did reading it for you. Well, back again next week. And of course, I keep saying I will finish off some of these series. And I will do my best to get round to it next week. <laughs> he says again. So you can probably expect the final part of uh, the Festival of Snow. But apart from that, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, you have a lovely weekend. Because I will be back with you again on Monday. For now, bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>